And uh, our next speaker is uh, Dawood. Uh, he's uh, also from um, he's also from Chennai, from IIT Chennai. And uh, Dawood, do you want to share your screen? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, hi, Subhati. Let me just let me just share the screen. Uh, um, the title of his talk is Reconstructing Space-Time Geometry from Non-Local Bi-Tensors from Singer's World Function to the Quantum Space-Time. So we're looking forward to hearing from him. So Dawood, uh, I will be uh, starting my um, talk <clears throat> and um, you will be reminded five minutes before your time is up. So at, in 35 minutes into your talk, I'll remind you and then, uh, of course, we'll let you know when your time is up. But all right, so sure. thanks. Uh, you can. So, could you just, uh, Sumati, could you confirm if my slides are visible? Yes, they're completely visible. They're, everything looks like it's working. Okay. Let me so, enter full screen. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's working. So, yeah. I will just enter full screen and start the presentation. So uh, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I would like to begin by thanking the Scientific Organizing Committee for inviting me to give this talk. I'll be speaking, as uh, Sumati just said, on uh, a certain set of tools and a formalism that we have been working on for the past few years. And uh, the role that certain so-called bi-tensors play in that formalism. Uh, and the key objects that we use are going to be standard objects from differential geometry, probably not very familiar. These are the kind of things that I want to describe and I want to indicate how these objects help us reconstruct the geometry of space-time, not in terms of local tensorial objects like metric tensor, et cetera, but in terms of bitensorial quantities. To begin with, I will just uh, have, uh, so this, Large part of this work I am going to present uh, was in collaboration with Paddy, who unexpectedly passed away uh, last year. Okay. And uh, I am going to indicate some of the connections which the results from this formalism I am going to describe as for uh, the so-called emergent gravi gravity paradigm uh, uh, in which Paddy uh, has played a pivotal role. Okay. So here is the plan of the talk, I will start by uh, uh, giving a very broad overview of uh, uh, what we know about the small scale structure of space time from arguments rooted essentially in semi-classical gravity. So there are thought experiments which you can do uh, in which you take into account both quantum field theory and curvature of space time. And that gives you some very generic results. And these are the kind of results that we want to take seriously and try to find the tools within the classical theory which help us incorporate these results in a natural manner into a description of geometry of space time. I will then actually describe this reconstructing reconstruction procedure. So how you can build up a description of space time geometry using a specific bi tensor which essentially measures geodesic distance between two points in manifold. Uh, usually you define geodesics using a metric, but if somebody just gives you a function depending on two points, which measures the geodesic distance between those points, you can reconstruct the metric. So I will describe this. The quantity that will play a key role in this is what is called a Singer's world function and the van like determinant, which is, uh, which it is possible to derive from the world function in a sense. I will introduce these objects and describe the reconstruction. And then I'll describe some of the results which we have been able to arrive at over the past few years using this reconstructed, uh, what we call as the effective metric. Uh, and some of the results that I'll discuss uh, are you know, certain relics of the quantum space time. There are some non-trivial limits that you get when at the end of your calculation, you said, uh, Planck length to zero. And these are the kind of things which connect the formalism to uh, things like the emergent gravity paradigm and so on. Okay. And finally, I will very quickly give a very broad outlook on the use of bi-tensors as tools to probe classical and quantum space time. Okay. And this will be uh, at a level where uh, certain ideas from 
information theory can be used to provide by tensors, which you can then use to reconstruct your space time uh, metric. Okay. So let me begin. Uh, I will begin with a very basic introduction to the domain in which all these results are supposed to lie. And I like this uh, uh, figure from Kokash's old paper, uh, which essentially gives you a landscape of physical theories. And the domain in which the calculation I am going to present should be taken to lie is a domain in which semi-classical effects are important. So you are essentially doing quantum field theory in curved space time, but you're also incorporating uh, some of the results that arise from doing thought experiments in that domain, such, that, such as the existence of a minimal length in space time. So uh, here will be the key theme. Of course, uh, the upper right is what I will uh, focus most of the talk on, that is the structure of space time at small scales and how you can characterize it by using the uh, by using the results that we already know. And then I'll try to see what, uh, whether this can provide any new insight into the results that have already been derived uh, uh, based on things like black hole thermodynamics, Unruh effect, and essentially the connection between gravity and thermodynamics. This also in, uh, includes topics uh, which are related essentially to the structure of quantum, quantum vacuum in curved space time, but that I will just give a very, very uh, quick word on it, and it will be covered in uh, two other talks in this uh, symposium, which I'll indicate towards the end of the end of my presentation. Okay. So here is again visiting Kukash's pyramid again, uh, with the added thing that uh, when you combine the principles of gender relativity and quantum theory, uh, there's a very generic result that you can show using essentially a setup similar to Heisenberg's microscope, but without ignoring the curvature of space time. And it says that there is, an, uh, there is a bound to operational measurement of space-time interval. And the bound is somewhere of the order of the Planck scale. Exact value is not relevant. The very fact that the bound exists is what is relevant. So I just keep calling this lower bound on measurement of space-time interval as L0. And the second insight, uh, like I said a couple of slides back, is that space-time can have thermal properties, which raises the natural question that uh, if, if you can explain these thermal properties from a more fundamental viewpoint. And of course, if you combine these two insights, the natural question is, uh, can the structure of space-time at small scale, specifically things like existence of an operational bound on measurement of space-time interval, can also in some way, maybe indirect, explain the origin of thermal properties of space-time, okay? And this is the connection which towards the end of the talk, I'll try to highlight. Here are the essentially the papers on which the uh, work will largely be based. Yeah. Okay, there are more references which are not here, but I can I can I can indicate to them based on questions which are. So let me begin by discussing the small scale structure of space time. As I said, the key thing that I want to do in this first part of the talk is to uh, highlight that if you do have something like a zero point length in space time, then there is a very high possibility and calculations is. Uh, calculations that I'll show will support this, that uh, such a space-time is governed, going to be governed by an action which is different from Einstein-Hilbert action. And this result is going to be independent of uh, L0 that you put in. So this is something that we called as grin of the Sashire cat. You put a zero point length in space-time, you do your calculation, and at the end of the day, you put uh, L0 equal to zero, you still get a result which is not quite what we expect from the classical theory. And the uh, key uh, question that helps us sa start setting up the formalism is the question whether the metric tensor is uh, the right candidate for even describing the effective degrees of freedom. There are uh, questions and issues surrounding this, but I'll try to uh, indicate the simplest object which can replace the metric tensor and give you, uh, give you a characterization of space-time geometry uh, by taking into account some of the non-local effects because of the existence of zero point length. Okay. So, uh, and this was already, uh, I, I like these quotes. This quote appeared in the paper by Rayman on the hypothesis, uh, which lie at the basis of geometry. I like some of the quotes here because he already uh, indicated that the, the metric, uh, the description of space in terms of metric may not be the, uh, may, not, may not be the best way to do it when you're probing distances which are very small. Okay. 
here are some older references which i'll take as motivation but will not focus on too much uh, the connection between gravity and a fundamental length scale has been explored for a long time and uh, in fact one aspect of this connection which is the deformation of uh, commutators and generalized uncertainty principle can also be recast in a covariant manner in terms of the tools which i am going to describe i will mention it in my last slide and this will be discussed in detail by raghavendra in his talk which is on pep pi that is the formulation of uh, commutators in curved space time okay. so these are again some of the references which i'll just leave here and uh, 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 this is to give you a flavor that the kind of arguments which lead to the uh, result that there is such an operational bound are based on uh, essentially the process of measurements in curved space time so for example the initial such paper or the setup was by saliker and wigner called as saliker wigner clock in which you use a clock to essentially set up uh, coordinates of an event so the trajectory shown there is trajectory of a clock you are trying to measure or localize an event labeled as event 2 there this is the figure from that paper and then you can use non relativistic quantum mechanics itself and the fact from gr that you know events be beyond the event horizon cannot be proved to arrive at such bounds so what i am trying to say is that these are very very generic results which uh, uh, which you can do by using basic principles of quantum theory and general relativity so here are then going to be uh, the two key inputs that i am going to use <coughs> so introduce a zero point length in space time but uh, we'll try to do it in a lorentz invariant manner so we don't want to mess up with lorentz invariance there are no good reasons to do it right now so we'll just keep it intact and uh, the second input about which i'll have to say a bit further down the line is that the same kind of effects which give you a lower bound on measurement of space time interval also provides a regularization of two point functions in space time so the short distance singularity of the propagator gets shifted and these the hints of this already were there in older papers by divit and many other results in the literature have been able to arrive at the same uh, same conclusion so these are some of the references i have listed here but there are of course many more i am not going to use it very directly but i am just going to use it uh, to fix uh, the effective metric to as much uh, uh, closed form as possible i'll indicate to you what are the left out terms that we will not be able to fix uh, without the second condition here okay. and as i indicate at the bottom of this slide metric tensor is it turns out is not a best candidate uh, best object to incorporate these features for one of course if you have a metric tensor you measure distances using that uh, in the coincidence limit you will not have any zero point length it requires a certain kind of it it, it requires you to uh, think of with the metric properties of your space or space time okay so uh, it's much better to use the geodesic interval between two events and this is formally characterized by an object called as the world function that's just a name given to it the reason we don't use the distance itself but rather the square of geodesic distance more precisely one half the square of geodesic distance is essentially because of some issues related to branch cuts in taking that square root thing so it's a very convenient object and we'll see that uh, the identities this object satisfies are much more convenient than the identities which the distance itself distance function itself satisfies okay then the inputs i showed in the previous slide effective, effectively mathematically amount to demanding that in the coincidence limit the distance function does not vanish one would imagine that some kind of quantum fluctuations and this was uh, done in some sense in this paper by uh, ohania some kind of average path integral average over quantum fluctuations will give you a residual distance even when two points are coincident uh, and this requires a non trivial modification of conventional description of space time so let me just uh, introduce the mathematical machinery the world function as i said is a simple object measures the geodesic interval between two points here y and z and uh, uh, this is also the setup for a generic by tensor by the way so Uh, since at the end of the talk i want to actually uh, indicate how general by tensors should be used for reconstruction these could be more general than the singe world function so uh, i should highlight here that the setup uh, for a generic by tensor remains the same so you basically have tangent spaces at two points in the manifold 
you construct what are called as the normal convex neighborhoods geodesically convex neighborhoods at both these points and then you define objects which transform as certain kind of tensors at y and a certain kind of tensor at z these two kinds need not be a same need not be the same for example an object can be a scalar at y a vector at z a bitensor can be a scalar at y a vector at z and so on okay we'll encounter these objects as we go along and although it might look uh, slightly uh, an overkill because if you give me a metric i can describe everything locally it's well worth highlighting that some very uh, ordinary textbook expressions for things like redshifts and frequency shifts in a gravitational field can be completely recast in terms of the world function i'm denoting it by omega and its derivative for example here i have taken a very elementary textbook description of frequency shift between an emitter and a receptor it is simply given by the expression which is shown on the slide here uh you should note that it depends on the gradient of omega and the four velocity of the emitter the source and the observer so basically you can be agnostic about whether this shift comes from a gravitational effect or a doppler effect or whatever you have it is a universal description of all kind of frequency shifts so that's the kind of universality and it's it's also the operationally most relevant way of describing physical processes in a curved space time okay. so the second thing which i will use uh, in what i am going to describe next is uh, not a single geodesic emanating from p not but a geodesic spray emanating from p not and this geodesic spray can be characterized by the transfer spread of geodesics when you move by a geodesic distance s and something i should indicate is i'll be using uh, different notations for the same object i am sorry about that s indicates essentially the geodesic length which is uh, basically the square root of twice omega i will also denote it by lambda in uh, subsequent slides so please excuse the notation mismatch but if you have any confusion please feel free to stop me and clarify okay so the transfer spread of geodesics is measured by what is called as van der determinant i'll give an expression for this quantity in the next few slides and these are the two objects which will turn out to be most relevant and uh, before i proceed let me just summarize whatever i said so far so basically what we are intending to do is uh, replace the conventional description of space time geometry which is usually in terms of a metric tensor by a description in terms of this distance function although i won't use because of the reasons i just mentioned i will not use the distance itself but rather the world function which is one half the square of this distance okay so here is some more supporting evidence that this is probably a good choice maybe uh, a much better choice when you incorporate the zero point length because if you take derivatives of omega and this is this can by using textbook level differential geometry to so take derivatives of omega and take the coincidence limit which is denoted by the square brackets here you get back the metric tensor and if you take if you keep taking certain combinations like that higher and higher derivatives of omega and the coincidence limit you can extract a good chunk of information about the curvature itself okay although uh, if you carefully notice uh, you get only certain components of curvature tensor i uh, i might have more to say about this towards the end of the talk but uh, this should tell you that omega does contain a good deal of information about the metric as well as the curvature of the background manifold and this uh, this is good because usually the way you describe a differentiable manifold locally is by using a taylor expansion of the form given here riemann normal coordinate expansion but that uh, might break down for various reasons uh, if you are probing space time at very small scales either because quantum fluctuations do not allow you to take the metric as eta ab at very small scale that's the first underlined red line there or because there are space time singularities which uh, make any such expansion useless okay so both of the reasons are good enough to not allow you to use such an expansion uh, and hence what we are going to do is for large distances uh, we are going to assume that the metric still uh, is given by a riemann normal coordinate expansion whereas at very small scales it's given by an effective metric which is going to be constructed by the tool i have just introduced the world function and the van der lactic determinant okay so coming to the math uh, if you remember the first input i indicated was 
simply the input about existence of a zero point length in space time. And that is simply a statement that geodesic distances do not go to zero when the points are coincident. Okay, I've already mentioned this before. The second input is slightly tricky, and it is there here that we can use uh, 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 the condition on the two point functions that I indicated earlier. Wow. That is, if uh, the same zero point length also regularizes or changes the singularity structure of the two point function, you can use the results already known in the literature to deduce uh, what kind of constraints the effective metric has to satisfy, such that the two point function in that effective metric, which is denoted by this box tilde here, that's the, the Lombardian that you would construct in the effective metric, actually uh, has sigma square replaced by S of sigma square. Now, the S of sigma square I've introduced here is an arbitrary function. We cannot fix it. It has to come from some quantum gravitational model or a framework. But the good news is that the results will not depend on the precise form of S of sigma square. This is just capturing our lack of information about how quantum gravity modifies the geodesic distances, but nothing more than that. The only condition is that when sigma is zero, it should give you landscape, blank length, sorry, or something of the order of blank length. The second condition I will come to again, because it's not a rigorous condition, but fortunately, the way you implement this condition also has very little effect on some of the coincidence limits that I'm going to present. And this is what I want to highlight in the subsequent. So here's some further, uh, uh, sorry, further uh, mathematical. Uh, that would, that would sorry, the question. Yeah, right. sorry. Yeah. Actually, ah, yes, yes. Sorry, just one question. On the previous slide, you have this uh, geodesic distance. Can you please explain what do you mean by this phrase geodesic distance? Because like given a metric, the geodesic distance by definition will go to zero if the two points are coincident. So I don't understand this, this comment, question one comment. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, usually that's what I said uh, a few slides back, that if a metric is given, one can actually compute uh, the uh, world function just by integrating GAB, DXA, DXB. And that will give you zero when the two points are coincident. So here, uh, geodesic distance is just, uh, just imagine it lying within code. What, uh, what I am assuming is that there is a mapping between sigma square and some f of sigma square, such that this f of sigma square does not go to zero as two points go to zero. So exactly like you said, this cannot be described in terms of a local metric tensor, because that will always imply that the geodesic distances will go to zero as two points are coincident. So that is the reason why we do not get back a local metric tensor, but something else. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether that answers the question, but it, it might become clearer as we go along, Amitabh. Yeah, no, I, I understand. So you, what you are saying is that for sigma, there is a metric, but for this function f, there may not be a metric. One exactly, thing. exactly, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, let, let me just indicate how your, uh, how your structure of the two-point function can help you fix, or rather what kind of uh, geometrical objects that you must encounter when you are trying to fix your effective metric. I have still not displayed the effective metric, by the way, it will come in a moment. Uh, uh, we are just trying to collect all the tools which will be required to fix it. But if you are appealing to the two point function or rather to the structure of the Dalambarshian operator and the corresponding Green's function, then uh, uh, it has a part which depends only on sigma square. Uh, the basically the header match parametrics. There's a logarithmic term, but I am putting that uh, as the subdominant term, you can also incorporate that. But a key idea is that the term in the two point function, which depends only on sigma square, if you take the Dalambarshian of that term, which I'm indicated by, uh, so I've separated the calligraphic G, which is a generic two point function. It will be uh, the Hedemat parametrics, which is indicated there, Van Dyck determinant divided by sigma square to, the, to some power plus additional terms coming from curvature, which I have not indicated, but that's not what, of, what is of concern here. Those are subdominant terms. The singular structure is captured by the, the leading term. So if you take box of it, it depends on the second derivatives of the world function and the world function itself. 
this is after imposing some identities uh, which i'll come to in the next slide but th this is something you can prove in the standard uh, by using you know standard uh, structure of the dalambarshian operator written in geodesic coordinates and this box of omega that is the dalambarshian acting on the world function you can actually show it's not very difficult to show just from the definition you can show that it has this structure where lambda as i said i am using mixed notation so sorry about it lambda is again the geodesic length in the background metric gab k is essentially the uh, trace of extrinsic curvature of surfaces of constant lambda these are the surfaces i had indicated in one of the previous slide when i was talking of geodesic spray you take a point p not of the manifold send out geodesic of length lambda from that point uh uh they'll form a surface a d minus 1 dimensional surface in k is the extrinsic curvature of that surface it's also uh, the expansion of the geodesic spray these are the same things so one can what this tells you is that you can expect any condition or that you put to regularize the singularity of the two point function can be captured by a condition on omega which we already have seen okay so if you do the same calculation uh, uh assuming that your sigma square is modified to some s of sigma square then there will be a condition on omega and you would also probably require some condition on the second derivatives of the world function the point of this slide is to indicate to you that the condition on the two point function and the condition on expansion of geodesic space they are not really independent conditions but they are interrelated okay so let me go to the next slide okay so here are some of the identities which so far i have not indicated the first identity is simply a defining equation for the world function uh, uh amitabh was just asking uh, if you look at the first identity here i hope the highlight okay i am not able to highlight this uh, it's the hamilton jacobi equation for the world function in terms of the background metric gab this will give you an omega which will go to zero when the points are coincident we want to replace it by an effective metric where the effective uh, uh, distance function satisfies the same identity with the additional restriction that uh, s does not go to zero as the points are coincident which immediately tells you that qab has to be a non trivial object it cannot be a local tensor uh, essentially because of properties of the metric space the van black determinant which i already indicated earlier has this expression i had not given the expression before but like i said that's an object which depends on second derivative of omega which is really the reason why you expect any condition on the two point function related to the condition on box omega will in turn be related to the van lack determinant okay and it satisfies some useful identities which i have put in the red box below but uh, you know will uh, if if there's a question i can explain those but they are just intermediate mathematical step in the derivation to fix your intuition uh, i have also given the van black uh, van black determinant for simplest of manifolds so these are two dimensional euclidean manifolds if you have a sphere and you send out geodesics from the north pole of the sphere you can again compute the uh, rate of expansion of the geodesic the geodesic spray and you can show that the van black determinant is just sin theta by theta where theta is the polar angle for flat space it's one and for uh, hyperbolic space it is given by sin hyperbolic whatever that argument is shown there so this is just to indicate to you that these are very primitive uh, objects not related to space time or quantum gravity or whatever but these are very primitive objects that characterize the geodesic structure of any space time and that's what is indicated here okay so basically this summarizes most of the tools that i want to build up my effective metric from as a point p not you send out time like or space like geodesic we'll focus first uh, you construct surfaces of constant geodesic distance the geometry of those surfaces is what you will use to impose the two condition uh, shown here um dawood dawood we have lost we you have, we lost you for a bit hello can you let me hear us dawood can you hear us 
I think his network seems to have got disconnected, uh, Sumati. Yeah. Just let me check uh, briefly. Yeah. Just give me a minute. Uh, Daud, we can see your slides. Please proceed. Daud, can you hear us? Uh, Sumati, you are able to hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, but I okay. cannot hear Daud. So yes, yes. I'll just stop uh, the clock for now until he comes back. Sure, 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 sure. We, it should be maybe there is a local network issue that he is facing. Just bear with us, please. We will resolve this. Dawood, if you are able to hear us, can you maybe disconnect and connect back if needed? Is there a way to get in touch with him? Yes, I spoke to him. I spoke to him just now, Sunati. I spoke to him. Let me just try him again. So, uh, because of this technical glitch, let's just uh, take a short break until Dawood comes back in. So, please, I request you to be patient. Yeah, just uh, please bear with us. Uh, uh, we are requesting Dawood to connect back. Okay, I've stopped the sharing so that he will connect back again. I see the wood around. He can he use his phone or yeah, Dawood, can you hear us now? Yes, please share your uh, screen and, and uh, please start where you left I've off. Yeah. I've basically given you stop the clock, so I will restart it now. Yeah. Yeah. You have to share the slides. After you put on your uh, share your slides, I'll restart it. So uh, I'm logging in from a different machine. I don't know what went wrong in the previous one. So I, I'm hoping that is visible now. Yes, yes Dawood, please proceed. Let me continue. I'm sorry about this. I have no idea what happened. So Can you make it full what, screen? Yeah. Uh, this is what I was... Uh, let me make it full screen. Uh, so this is essentially the geodesic structure of space-time, which, uh, which uh, characterizes all the tools that I would require to set up my effective metric. 
here are some of the mathematical identities i think i will just uh, rush to this part uh, because some time has already gone by if there are questions i can come back to this slide it only indicates how the second derivatives of omega are related to the extrinsic curvature i already indicated this relation earlier here is a more detailed version of the same and then you can have a taylor expansion of these second derivatives in terms of tidal tensors this eab uh, and its derivatives effectively represent the tidal tensors so what i have indicated by s here is uh, uh, what are indicated by calligraphic eab in this expansion okay so these uh, these are the quantities that will essentially go into the construction of the two matrix so let me just come back to the final result and describe to you in one slide how it, how you can arrive at it so if you impose all the conditions i have indicated before you can fix your effective metric in terms of gab and the tangent vectors to the geodesic uh, at one of the endpoints which is indicated here by ta so just remember this figure it has all the things okay so that is uh, what that is the structure that it takes and again coming back to what amita was initially asking you will notice that this object is is a is the simplest by tensor you can have to describe the metric geometry in the sense that its indices a and b are anchored at the point p whereas it also depends like a scalar on the point p not the base point p not that you have more general construction of the by tensor would involve the indices also depending on the two points but this is the simplest effective description that i am going to discuss and the transformation indicated here is what has been known in the literature in a different context as a dispermal transformation but that is just a jargon which i don't want to focus on so basically the conditions uh, that i imposed before will fix your a and b and uh, i should highlight here that this object you have is singular in the coincidence limit this is again tied to the fact that a non singular object cannot give you uh, uh, geodesic distances which do not vanish in the coincidence limit so that you can expect some kind of a singular structure to it only after you compute curvature uh, and its concomitants from qab can you confirm that there are no divergences at the level of curvature for which you first have to define curvature properly for objects like this okay and of course when l0 is set to 0 your qab you just recover your metric tensor g here are again some details on how the conditions are fixed so if i use my hamilton jacobi equation it's easy to show that it fixes the combination a minus b in this metric to this form and then you can parameterize a as in terms of a function f as i have shown there this itself is strong enough to indicate to you that f should have the form delta to the power 2 by d minus 1 delta is the van lack determinant into some uh, uh some quantity and it is to fix this 1 plus dot 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 that you require the condition on the two point function but you can also uh, acknowledge some other constraints that your qab must satisfy and the most important one according to me is the scaling constraint that is you know that suppose you were not doing quantum gravity suppose you didn't have a minimal length or whatever suppose you had an ordinary differentiable manifold and your functions were related by a scaling transformation like this suppose you take geodesic distances and just multiply all of them by a constant square root of alpha not then your matrix you expect to be related by a simple scaling transformation if you also want your effective matrix you know in this case there is no zero point length sigma goes to zero s of sigma square also goes to zero but in these case in if you want to incorporate the scaling transformation you should require that f goes to 1 when whenever s of sigma square is alpha not sigma square this actually puts further constraints on that 1 plus dot 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 there i will not be discussing it further in this talk because my coincidence limits and whatever do not really depend on that extra term as long as it is finite in the coincidence limit okay so now the question i want to ask uh, uh, just interrupting for a moment sumati uh, how much time do i have yeah you because have you have uh, another uh about 7 minutes so i think you should yeah uh, we, i just stopped the clock when you went off so we're back on okay, track okay, with okay, the okay. Okay. i will try to i will try to wind up in another 7 to 10 minutes so that i hope that that will be fine yeah i will i will give you the reminder in a couple of minutes when the 35 minute mark is up but yeah yeah, yeah. no i i was just because this is not going to do that okay 
So uh, the question we want to ask now is if you compute the Ricci scalar corresponding to this effective QAP that you have constructed and the Ricci scalar you would construct by using the same procedure as you construct the standard Ricci scalar from a metric in differential geometry. So you take P as the variable point, you'll get a Ricci scalar as a function of P naught and you can compute these things and you want to compute some limits of that object. You expect that when you take L0 equal to zero, you will recover the standard results, which it indeed does happen. But uh, you are also interested in the coincidence limit because you do get a non-local object, which depends on two points, P and P0. And you want to know what is the coincidence limit of that object. And this computation uh, is slightly messy, but it's summarized in this table. So uh, what I want you to focus on is the last box on this table that uh, finally gives you the Ricci scalar. So what happens is uh, when you take the Ricci scalar computed using the QAV and you take the coincidence limit without setting L0 to zero, you get an expansion whose leading term is uh, effectively, so leading term I have noted here as SG, I will give you the expression for SG in the next few slides. But the point is that it is not the Ricci scalar of the background geometry, it's something else. So here is that uh, slightly messy expression I was talking about. You can uh, obtain it in a closed form. It has some nice features, which I don't have time to discuss here. Then you use your standard expansions, which I have indicated before. And the limits give you something which is RAB uh, TATB. That is, you take the Ricci uh, tensor of the background geometry and you dot it with the uh, geodesic. Uh, which is connecting P to P naught, a tangent factor to a geodesic. There's a numerical factor, which is essentially minus four, but that is not relevant here. See, the only thing which is relevant here is that the leading term is not the Ricci scalar of the background geometry, okay? And that uh, is what is going to connect the implications of this small scale structure of space time to what I was indicating in the beginning slide with the thermal thermodynamic aspects of gravity. In that last line, if you set L0 equal to zero, you get some remnant of the fact that you had started with a divergent non-local object, QAB, and then derived uh, the curvature in the standard way. Okay, so sort of uh, that term has some kind of a memory that your space-time had a zero point length, although that term does not depend on L0 itself. So here are some more results. Uh, this I have already indicated. You can also compute the surface term, the given stocking term, on the equigeodesic surface in the same geometry using the QAB. That also seems to acquire an additional term. That additional term depends essentially on the ratio of the zero point length to Planck length. I mean, you may take L0 equal to LP and that mu, then mu will be equal to one, but otherwise it's just a constant term. So this already indicates to you that if you have a space time with a zero point length and you characterize it using non-local objects, uh, suitably constructed by using some of the inputs from semi-classical gravity, then you might get limits which are non-trivial. It's effectively coming because of the interplay of non-local and non-analytic structure of the QAB. And these are the limits I tried to indicate. There are some other curious known results in the literature which are very similar in nature. So these are not unfamiliar in physics, but uh, the, uh, the result that is indicated here is very directly relevant to what is called as the emergent gravity paradigm, which I'll mention as I end. Okay. So let me also now go to the part where I discuss implicate, further implications for this. A, a very immediate implication of this is what happens when you try to compute other geometrical quantities like volume, area, et cetera, uh, using the QAB instead of the background metric tensor because QAB is now your effective Metrics. So you can define an effective uh, sort of geometrical dimension. Uh, this is very closely related to the standard way in which you define a box dimension. Uh, you might wonder about that uh, scaling in the expression VD divided by VD at L not equal to zero. This is just to remove the spurious curvature effects. We are not interested in the curvature effects on dimensions of space time. The effective dimension is always uh, is only supposed to here capture the effects because of the existence of L0, okay? And that log term just removes the spurious curvature effects. And that indicates dimensional reduction. And this is, although the plot has been made by taking a specific form for S of sigma square, 
it can be shown that in the coincidence limit the dimensions always fall down to 2 irrespective of the form of s of sigma square okay so that indicates dimensional reduction this is also something which is known from various other arguments uh there's a review by carl which discusses all of them next application which i want to indicate i wanted to spend a bit more time on this but uh, i i can take it up in the question session uh, is that you can actually analyze space time singularities effectively from two different points of view what you can do is you can either set up the right row three equation with the zero point length which has been done in collaboration with sumanto and alejandro peski so that can be done and you can again go back to the Uh, singularity theorems and see how they get affected that's the part we have not done but you can also set up a toy model uh, to analyze what happens in the simplest case of uh, singularity in the flrw universe and here uh, we do have some uh, preliminary results is you can Zawud, you are again. Write down the expression for the world function, which is given there. Uh, slightly unfamiliar expression, and you want to focus on. Oh, okay. Is this better? Is this clearer? Yeah, I yes. also just want to uh, tell you that uh, the forty minutes is up. Uh, you can, you know, uh, if you can wrap up in the next minute or so, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I will try to wind up in five or eight minutes, uh, Sumati. um okay uh, so is that okay otherwise yeah. i can go to the concluding slide just yeah, take a few I more minutes that would and uh, yeah few more minutes maybe yeah. a couple of minutes and then if you can do that because okay. we, we can have some time for questions yeah where sure. we have to do our question session yeah i will i will do that yeah so uh, so let me just skip this part what i wanted to indicate is you can do a toy model computation in flrw universe and uh, what you can show is that if you compute the ricci scalar now this is uh, uh, this is a very general computation you can do i mean not depending on coincidence limits or whatever but you do get some kind of an indication that the ricci scalar might be finite this is only the ricci scalar by the way we have not been able to do it for riemann full riemann tensor or krashman invariant so far but ricci scalar seems to be finite in the coincidence limit as you approach the singularity okay there are also comments you can make about the causal structure at small scales just from the form of gab they will be uh, uh, just from the form of gab you can show that light cones shrink at small scales so that is one more comment you can make i'm not going to focus on that uh, you can also discuss the small scale structure of space time in terms of its euclidianization i will again skip this part but uh, the moral of this is also that your euclidian Uh, action or the lagrangian is governed not by the ricci scalar but by either the einstein tensor or the ricci tensor okay so details i leave the final thing i wanted to talk about was implications of all this for the emergent gravity paradigm again there is no time to do this so i will just leave you with this figure uh, the key thing is that uh, the entropy functional that people usually use to formulate the emergent gravity paradigm is something which seems to be naturally coming out as the ricci scalar coincidence limit ricci scalar of the quantum metric more details are available in the citation i have given there okay so here is my last slide which sort of provides the broader outlook on using by tensors as tools to probe classical and quantum space time uh, i have already indicated much of this during the talk there are also a couple of talks which will discuss these tools further okay and the whole program is summarized in that blue box at the bottom of the slide that is from two point function you can go to the effective metric when you set l not equal to 0 there you should get back the background geometry but if you don't set l not to 0 some interesting effects can arise okay so here is summary of the talk and some future outlook i will just leave this slide uh, since i think i have already overrun the time i leave these slides and maybe a good time to ask the questions now yeah yes yeah, so so let's thank dawood and sorry for the interruptions but uh, that was mostly I from a very side. interesting talk no very interesting talk uh, and uh, let's go to questions now let me just see whether i can uh, see the questions uh, are there any raised hands 
we already had one question during the there are, okay there are yes there are many raised hands so uh, let me start with niranjan uh, hello sir can you hear me yes we can hear yes, you niranjan yes. please go ahead with your question so uh, in the beginning of the talk you said that uh, we can introduce uh, the zero point length the uh, uv cutoff uh, without violating lorentz invariance so uh, i'm not we have fully clear on how we maintain Lorentz invariance by introducing the UV cutoff in this whole uh, system. Ah, yes, Niranjan. So usually uh, people get uh, usually this argument, which uh, probably is the one which is bugging you, is that uh, you know if you do Lorentz transformations, there will be length contraction, and then uh, you know you will no longer have a minimal length. But that is not. Uh, that is not sort of a rigorous argument because minimal length is, we are not talking about length of uh, you know, rods or a measurement apparatus. We are talking of L0 as, at least in the context I have described, as uh, a bound on geodesic intervals. So these, if you do Lorentz transformations on both the points X and Y, the sigma square is an invariant uh, under Lorentz transformations. So at least at a mathematical level, I can just say that it's Lorentz invariant. But at a physical level, I just wanted to emphasize that there's no reason to believe that uh, existence of a zero point length will necessarily break Lorentz invariance. Um, okay. We can move on to the next question from Alok. Hi, Alok. Oh, hi, hi. Uh, yeah, so the, when you take this, uh, when you compute say, the Riemann, and take the L0 going to zero limit and you got this uh, order one deviation, right? As you were explaining. Uh, so, but if I take L0 to be L Planck and then I take uh, L Planck to zero, means I'm taking just classical limit. So then this deviation, what does it depend on? Uh, I mean, it's, it's like an order one classical effect that somehow you're getting or? Yes, yes, because there is no, uh, so that leading term does not, uh, uh, I see what you're asking. You're asking whether yeah. the lead term is, yeah. is having a ratio of say L naught to L Planck. Yeah. Is that... yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so somehow it. It, it depends on it depends on alpha, but I, I, I missed what alpha was there. It depends on no, one no. parameter, is it? Like... So I mean... alpha is the number. I see. So it, it's, it's basically the it's basically equal to D, the dimension of space time. Okay, I didn't want to. I see, I see. Yeah. So you were saying some of classical, you said classical deviation. That's what I was confused about. It looks like, yes. I mean, if I take it. I see. Or is it, is it, uh, if, if I may ask, uh, is it a, uh, is it a sort of something that you have to set a scale for that deviation, right? Because if it is a classical deviation, you're going to, there has to be some kind of mesoscale that is there at which this deviation yeah. comes. But like uh, Alok said, it doesn't look. It's not clear whether there is such a no. So that scale in your extra scale in your theory that would allow for such a no. So the whatever I have described, there is no extra scale. So that alpha there was did not involve uh, any. It was not having any dependence on ratios like L naught by L Planck. That doesn't come there. Where it might come is when you construct the action because the action is an LP square. Uh, in the denominator and such a ratio does come up because the second uh, so one part of the talk which i have skipped is what happens if space time is also euclidean at small scales then the scales the ratios that will come that is more relevant to alok's question i think mm -hmm. okay. is the scale at which the transition from lorentz euclidean to lorentzian happens mm -hmm. uh, so that will have a scale lt and there will be a scale l0 which we have introduced the zero point scale uh, I have seen some comments on this in the context of LQG, I think, if I'm not wrong, but uh, we have not explored that part okay, okay. much. Okay, so since there are, as far as I can tell, no other questions, let's uh, thank Dawood again for an intriguing talk, which will make us uh, think uh, into the rest of the day, at least. Um, so... Uh, and I think there's now, if I'm not mistaken, a break, a coffee break. We can all go privately and drink our coffee. Um, and we will return at 
in about 15 minutes in about yeah in about 15 minutes okay 11 30 is when it is so yes a little bit more than 15 minutes so yeah all right thanks uh thank you thank you thank you sumati for chairing the session as sumati 